Part 3 of Lone Star Planet by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. Read for you by Mark Nelson. This here LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lone Star Planet, Chapter 5 I looked around. We were on a high balcony at the end of a long, narrow room. In front of us, windows rose to the ceiling, and it was evident that the floor of the room was about twenty feet below ground level. Outside I could see the barbecue still going on, but not a murmur of noise penetrated to us. What seemed to be the judge's bench was against the outside wall under the tall windows. To the right of it was a railed stand with a chair in it and in front, arranged in U-shape, were three tables at which a number of men were hastily conferring. There were nine judges in a row on the bench, all in black gowns. The spectator seats below were filled with people, and there were quite a few up here on the balcony. "'What is this, Supreme Court?' I asked, as Gail piloted me to a couple of seats where we could be alone. "'No, Court of Political Justice she told me. This is the court that's going to try those three Bonnie brothers who killed Mr. Cumshaw. It suddenly occurred to me that this was the first time I had heard anything specific about the death of my predecessor. That isn't the trial that's going on now, I hope. Oh, no, that won't be for a couple of days, not till after you can arrange to attend. I don't know what this trial is. I only got home today myself. What's the procedure here? I wanted to know. Well, those nine men are judges, she began. The one in the middle is President Judge Nelson. You've met his son, the ranger officer who chased you from the spaceport? He's just a regular jurist. The other eight are prominent citizens who are drawn from a panel, like a jury. The men at the table on the left are the prosecution, friends of the politician who was killed and the ones on the right are the defense. They'll try to prove that the dead man got what was coming to him. The ones in the middle are friends of the court. They're just anybody who has any interest in the case, people who want to get some point of law cleared up, or see some precedent established, or something like that. You seem to assume that this is a homicide case, I mentioned. They generally are, sometimes mayhem, or wounding, or simple assault, but— there had been some sort of conference going on in the open space of floor between the judge's bench and the three tables. It broke up now, and the judge in the middle rapped with his gavel. "'Are you gentlemen ready?' he asked. "'All right, then. Court of Political Justice of the Confederate Continents of New Texas is now in session. Case of the Friends of S. Austin Maverick, deceased, late of James Bowie Continent, versus Wilbur Waitley. "'My God!' Did somebody finally kill Os Maverick? Gail whispered. On the center table, in front of the friends of the court, both sides seemed to have piled their exhibits. Among the litter I saw some torn clothing, a big white sombrero covered with blood, and a long machete. The general nature of the case, the judge was saying, is that the defendant, Wilbur Waitley, of Sam Houston Continent, as here charged with diverse offenses arising from the death of the Honorable S. Austin Maverick, whom he killed on the front steps of the Legislative Assembly Building here in New Austin. What goes on here? I thought angrily. This is the rankest instance of a prejudged case I've ever seen. I started to say as much to Gail, but she hushed me. I want to hear the specifications, she said. A man at the prosecution table had risen. "'Please the court,' he began. "'The defendant, Wilbur Waitley, is here charged with political irresponsibility and excessive atrocity in exercising his constitutional right of criticism of a practicing politician. The specifications are as follows. That, on the afternoon of May 7th, Anno Domini 2193, the defendant here present did arm himself with a machete, said machete not being one of his normal and accustomed weapons, 
and did loiter in wait on the front steps of the Legislative Assembly Building in the city of New Austin, continent of Sam Houston, and did approach the decedent, addressing him in abusive, obscene, and indecent language, and did set upon and attack him with the machete aforesaid, causing the said decedent, S. Austin Maverick, to die. The court wanted to know how the defendant would plead. Somebody, without bothering to rise, said, "'Not guilty, Your Honor,' from the defense table. There was a brief scraping of chairs. Four of five men from the defense and the prosecution tables got up and advanced to confer in front of the bench, comparing sheets of paper. The man who had read the charges, obviously the chief prosecutor, made himself the spokesman. "'Your Honor, defense and prosecution wish to enter the following stipulations.' that the decedent was a practicing politician within the meaning of the Constitution, that he met his death in the manner stated in the coroner's report, and that he was killed by the defendant, Wilbur Whaley. "'Is that agreeable to you, Mr. Vincent?' the judge wanted to know. The defense answered affirmatively. I sat back, gaping like a fool. Why, that was practically—no, it was—a confession. "'All right, gentlemen.' the judge said. Now we have all that out of the way, let's get on with the case. As though there were any case to get on with. I fully expected them to take it on from there in song, words by Gilbert and music by Sullivan. Well, Your Honor, we have a number of character witnesses, the prosecution, prosecution for God's sake, announced. Skip them, the defense said. We stipulate— but you can't stipulate character testimony, the prosecution argued. You don't know what our witnesses are going to testify to. Sure we do. They're going to give us a big, long, shaggy dog story about the life and miracles of St. Austin Maverick. We'll agree in advance to all that. This case is concerned only with his record as a politician. And as he spent the last fifteen years in the Senate, that's all a matter of public record. I assume that the prosecution is going to introduce all that, too. Well, naturally, the prosecution began. Including his public acts on the last day of his life, the counsel for the defense demanded, his actions on the morning of May 7th as chairman of the Finance and Revenue Committee. You going to introduce that as evidence for the prosecution? Well, now, the prosecutor began. Your Honor, we asked to have a certified copy of the proceedings of the Senate Finance and Revenue Committee for the morning of May 7, 2193, read into the record of this court, the counsel for the defense said, and thereafter we rest our case. Has the prosecution anything to say before we close the court? Judge Nelson inquired. Well, Your Honor, this seems, that is, we ought to hear both sides of it. My old friend, Oss Maverick, was a really fine man. He did a lot of good for the people of this continent. Yeah, we'd a lynched him when we got back if somebody hadn't chopped him up here in New Austin, a voice from the rear of the courtroom broke in. The prosecution hemmed and hawed for a moment, then announced in a hasty mumble that it rested. I will now close the court, Judge Nelson said. I advise everybody to keep your seats. I don't think it's going to be closed very long. And then he actually closed the court. Pressing a button on the bench, he raised a high black screen in front of him and his colleagues. It stayed up for some sixty seconds and then dropped again. The Court of Political Justice has reached a verdict, he announced. Wilbur Waitley and your attorney approach and hear the verdict. The defense lawyer motioned a young man who had been sitting beside him to rise. In the silence that had fallen, I could hear the defendant's boots squeaking as he went forward to hear his fate. The judge picked up a belt and a pair of pistols that had been lying in front of him. "'Wilbur Waitley,' he began, "'this court is proud to announce that you have been unanimously acquitted of the charge of political irresponsibility and of unjustified and excessive atrocity.' There was one dissenting vote on acquitting you of the charge of political irresponsibility, 
one of the associate judges felt that the late, unmitigated scoundrel, Austin Maverick, ought to have been skinned alive an inch at a time. You are, however, acquitted of that charge, too. You all know, he continued, addressing the entire assemblage, the reason for which this young hero cut down that monster of political iniquity, S. Austin Maverick. On the very morning of his justly merited death, Austin Maverick, using the powers of his political influence, rammed through the Finance and Revenue Committee a bill entitled, An Act for the Taxing of Personal Incomes and for the Levying of a Withholding Tax. Fellow citizens, words fail me to express my horror of this diabolic proposition, this proposed instrument of tyrannical extortion, borrowed from the dark ages of the twentieth century. Why, if this young nobleman had not taken his blade in hand, I'd have killed the son of a bitch myself." He leaned forward, extending the belt and holsters to the defendant. "'I therefore restore to you your weapons, taken from you when, in compliance with the law, you were formally arrested. Buckle them on, and assuming your weapons again, go forth from this court a free man, Wilbur Waitley and take with you that machete with which you vindicated the liberties and rights of all new Texans. Bear it reverently to your home, hang it among your lairs and pennants, cherish it, and dying, mention it within your will, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto your issue. Court adjourned. Next session, O oh, nine hundred tomorrow. For Christ's sake, let's get out of here before the barbecue's over. Some of the spectators, drooling for barbecued super-cow, began crowding and jostling toward the exits. More of them were pushing to the front of the courtroom, cheering and waving their hip-flasks. The prosecution and about half of the friends of the court hastily left by a side door, probably to issue statements disassociating themselves from the deceased Maverick. So, that's the court that's going to try the men who killed Ambassador Cumshaw," I commented, as Gale and I went out. Why, the purpose of that court seems to be to acquit murderers. Murderers? She was indignant. That wasn't murder. He just killed a politician. All the court could do was determine whether or not the politician needed it, and while I never heard about Maverick's income tax proposition, I can't see how they could have brought in any other kind of verdict. Of all the outrageous things!" I was thoughtfully silent as we went out into the plaza, which was still a riot of noise and polychromatic costumes, and my thoughts were as weltered as the scene before me. Apparently, on New Texas, killing a politician wasn't regarded as malum in se and was malum prohibitorum only to the extent that what happened to the politician was in excess of what he deserved. I began to understand why Palm was such a scared rabbit, why Hutchinson had that hunted look and kept his hands always within inches of his pistols. I began to feel more pity than contempt for Thromley, too. He's been on this planet too long, and he should never have been sent here in the first place. I'll rotate him home as soon as possible." Then the full meaning of what I had seen finally got through to me. If they were going to try the killers of Cumshaw in that court, that meant that on New Texas foreign diplomats were regarded as practicing politicians. That made me a practicing politician, too. And that's why, when we got back to the vicinity of the bandstand, I had my right hand close to my pistol with my thumb on the inconspicuous little spot of silver inlay that operated the secret holster mechanism. I saw Hutchinson and Palm and Thromley ahead. With them was a newcomer, a portly, ruddy-faced gentleman with a white mustache and goatee, dressed in a white suit. Gale broke away from me and ran toward him. This, I thought, would be her father. Now I would be introduced and find out just what her last name was. I followed, more slowly, and saw a waiter with a wheeled serving-table move in behind the group which he had joined. So I saw what none of them did. 
the waiter suddenly reversed his long carving-knife and poised himself for a blow at President Hutchinson's back. I simply pressed the little silver stud on my belt, the Krupp Tata popped obediently out of the holster into my open hand. I thumbed off the safety and swung up. When my sights closed on the rising hand that held the knife, I fired. Hottie Ringo, who had been holding a sandwich with one hand and a drink with the other, dropped both and jumped on the man whose hand I had smashed. A couple of rangers closed in and grabbed him also. The group around President Hutchinson had all turned and were staring from me to the man I had shot, and from him to the knife with the broken handle lying on the ground. Hutchinson spoke first. "'Well, Mr. Ambassador, my government thanks your government. That was nice shooting.' "'Hey, you've been holding out on me,' Hottie accused. "'I never knew you was that kind of gunfighter.' "'There's a new wrinkle,' the man with the white goatee said. "'We'll have to screen the help of these affairs a little more closely.' He turned to me. "'Mr. Ambassador, New Texas owes you a great deal for saving the President's life. If you'll get that pistol out of your hand, I'd be proud to shake it, sir.' I holstered my automatic and took his hand. Gail was saying, "'Stephen, this is my father.' and at the same time Palm, the Secretary of State, was doing it more formally. "'Ambassador Silk, may I present one of our leading citizens and large ranchers, Colonel Andrew Jackson Hickok?' Dumbarton Oaks had taught me how to maintain the proper diplomat's unchanging expression. Drinking super-bourbon had been a postgraduate course. I needed that training as I finally learned Gale's last name. Chapter 6 It was early evening before we finally managed to get away from the barbecue. Thrombley had called the embassy and told them not to wait dinner for us, so the staff had finished eating and were relaxing in the patio when our car came in through the street gate. Stonehenge and another man came over to meet us as we got out, a man I hadn't met before. He was a little fellow, half Latin, half Oriental in New Texas costume, and wearing a pair of pistols like mine, in State Department Special Services holsters. He didn't look like a dumb Barton Oaks product. I thought he was more likely an alumnus of some private detective agency. "'Mr. Francisco Peros, our intelligence man,' Stonehenge introduced him. "'Sorry, I wasn't here when you arrived, Mr. Silk,' Peros said. "'Out checking on some things.' but I saw that bit of shooting on the telecast screen in a bar over town. You know, there was a camera right over the bandstand that caught the whole thing. You and Miss Hickok coming toward the President and his party. Miss Hickok running forward to her father. The waiter going up behind Hutchinson with the knife, and then that beautiful draw and snapshot. They ran it again a couple of times on the half-hourly newscast. Everybody in New Austin, maybe on New Texas, is talking about it now. Yes, indeed, sir, Gomez, the embassy secretary, said, joining us. You've made yourself more popular in the eight hours since you landed than poor Mr. Cumshaw had been able to do in the ten years he spent here. But I'm afraid, sir, you've given me a good deal of work, answering your fan mail. He went over and sat down at one of the big tables under the arches at the side of the patio. "'Well, that's all to the good,' I said. "'I'm going to need a lot of local goodwill in the next few weeks.' "'No thanks, Mr. Peros,' I added, as the intelligence man picked up a bottle and made to pour for me. "'I've been practically swimming in super-bourbon all afternoon. A little black coffee, if you don't mind. And now, gentlemen, if you'll all be seated, we'll see what has to be done.' "'A council of war, in effect, Mr. Ambassador?' Stonehenge inquired. "'Let's call it a council to estimate the situation. But I'll have to find out from you first exactly what the situation here is.' Thrombley stirred uneasily. "'But, sir, I confess that I don't understand. Your briefing on Luna was practically non-existent. I had a total of six hours to get aboard ship.' from the moment I was notified that I had been appointed to this embassy. Incredible! 
Thromley murmured. I wondered what he'd say if I told him that I thought it was deliberate. Naturally, I spent some time on the ship reading up on this planet, but I know practically nothing about what's been going on here in, say, the last year. And all I know about the death of Mr. Cumshaw is that he is said to have been killed by three brothers named Bonnie. So you'll want just about everything, Mr. Silk, Thromley said. Really, I don't know where to begin. Start with why and how Mr. Cumshaw was killed. The rest, I believe, will key into that. So they began, Thromley, Stonehenge, and Peros doing the talking. It came to this. Ever since we had first established an embassy on New Texas, the goal of our diplomacy on this planet had been to secure it into the Solar League. And it was a goal which seemed very little closer to realization now than it had been twenty-three years before. "'You must know by now what politics on this planet are like, Mr. Silk,' Thromley said. "'I have an idea. One ambassador gone native, another gone crazy, the third killed himself, the fourth murdered.' "'Yes, indeed. I've been here fifteen years myself. That's entirely too long for anybody to be stationed in this place,' I told him. "'If I'm not murdered myself in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to see that you and any other member of this staff who's been here over ten years are rotated home for a tour of duty at department headquarters. Oh, would you, Mr. Silk? I would be so happy!" Thromley wasn't much in the way of an ally, but at least he had a sound, selfish motive for helping me stay alive. I assured him I would get him sent back to Luna, and then went on with the discussion. Up until six months ago, Silas Cumshaw had modeled himself after the typical New Texas politician. He had always worn at least two faces, had always managed to place himself on every side of every issue at once. Nothing he ever said could possibly be construed as controversial. Naturally, the cause of New Texan annexation to the Solar League had made no progress whatever. Then, one evening, at a banquet, he had executed a complete one-hundred-degree turn, delivering a speech in which he proclaimed that union with the Solar League was the only possible way in which new Texans could retain even a vestige of local sovereignty. He had talked about an invasion as though the enemy ships were already coming out of hyperspace, and had named the invader, calling the Zesroff our common enemy. The Zesroff ambassador, also present, had immediately gotten up and stalked out, amid a derisive chorus of barking and baying from the New Texans. The New Texans were first shocked, and then wildly delighted. They had been so used to hearing nothing but inanities and high-order abstractions from their public figures that the Solar League ambassador had become a hero overnight. Sounds as though there is a really strong sentiment at what used to be called the grassroots level in favor of annexation, I commented. There is, Peros told me. Of course, there is a very strong isolationist anti-annexation sentiment, too. The sentiment in favor of annexation is based on the point Mr. Cumshaw made, the danger of conquest by the Zesroff. Against that, of course, there is fear of higher taxes, fear of loss of local sovereignty, fear of abrogation of local customs and institutions, and chauvinistic pride. We can deal with some of that by furnishing guarantees of local self-government. The emotional objections can be met by convincing them that we need the great planet of New Texas to add glory and luster to the Solar League," I said. You think, then, that Mr. Cumshaw was assassinated by opponents of annexation?" "'Of course, sir,' Thromley replied. "'These bonnies were only hirelings. Here's what happened on the day of the murder. It was the day after a holiday, a big one here on New Texas, celebrating some military victory by the Texans on Terra, a battle called San Jacinto. We didn't have any business to handle, because all the local officials were home nursing hangovers. So, when Colonel Hickok called—' "'Who?' I asked sharply. "'Colonel Hickok. 
the father of the young lady you were so attentive to at the barbecue. He and Mr. Cumshaw had become great friends, beginning shortly before the speech the ambassador made at the banquet. He called about 0900, inviting Mr. Cumshaw out to his ranch for the day, and as there was nothing in the way of official business, Mr. Cumshaw said he'd be out by 10.30. When he got there, there was an air-car circling about, near the ranch house. As Mr. Cumshaw got out of his car and started up the front steps, somebody in this car landed it on the driveway and began shooting with a twenty-millimeter auto-rifle. Mr. Cumshaw was hit several times and killed instantly. "'The fellows who did the shooting were damn lucky,' Stonehenge took over. "'Hickok's a big rancher. I don't know how much you know about super-cow ranching, sir, but those things have to be herded with tanks and light aircraft, so that every rancher has at his disposal a fairly good small-armor combat team. Naturally, all the big ranchers are colonels in the armed reserve. Hickok has about fifteen fast fighters, and thirty medium tanks, armed with fifty-millimeter guns. He also has some AA guns around his ranch house. Every once in a while, these ranchers get to squabbling among themselves. Well, these three Bonnie brothers were just turning away when a burst from the ranch house caught their jet assembly, and they could only get as far as Bonnieville, thirty miles away, before they had to land. They landed right in front of the town jail. This Bonnieville's an awful shanty town. Everybody in it is related to everybody else. The mayor, for instance, Kettlebelly Sam Bonnie, is an uncle of theirs. These three boys, Switchblade Joe Bonnie, Jack High Abe Bonnie, and Turkey Buzzard Tom Bonnie, immediately claimed sanctuary in the jail, on the grounds that they had been near to. Get that, I think that indicates the line they're going to take at the trial, near to a political assassination. They were immediately given the protection of the jail, which is about the only well-constructed building in the place, practically a fort. "'You think that was planned in advance?' I asked. Paros nodded emphatically. "'I do. There was a hell of a big gang of these bonnies at the jail, almost the entire able-bodied population of the place. As soon as Switchblade and Jack High and Turkey Buzzard landed, they were rushed inside and all the doors barred. About three minutes later, the Hickok outfit started coming in, first aircraft and then armor. They gave that town a regular George Patton-style blitzing. Yes, I'm only sorry I wasn't there to see it, Stonehenge put in. They knocked down or burned most of the shanties, and then they went to work on the jail. The aircraft began dumping these firebombs and stun bombs that they used to stop supercow stampedes, and the tank guns began to punch holes in the walls. As soon as Kettlebelly saw what he had on his hands, he radioed a call for ranger protection. Our friend Captain Nelson went out to see what the trouble was. Yes, I got the story of that from Nelson, Peros put in. Much as he hated to do it, he had to protect the Bonnies and as soon as he'd taken a hand, Hickok had to call off his gang. But he was smart. He grabbed everything relating to the killing, the air car and the twenty-millimeter auto rifle in particular, and he's keeping them under cover. Very few people know about that, or about the fact that on physical evidence alone he has the killing pinned on the body so well that they'll never get away with this story of being merely innocent witnesses. The rest, Mr. Silk, is up to us," Thrombley said. I have Colonel Hickok's assurance that he will give us every assistance, but we simply must see to it that those creatures with the outlandish names are convicted. I didn't have a chance to say anything to that. At that moment one of the servants ushered Captain Nelson toward us. "'Good evening, Captain,' I greeted the ranger. "'Join us seeing that you're on foreign soil and consequently not on duty. He sat down with us and poured a drink. "'I thought you might be interested,' he said. "'We gave that waiter a going over. We wanted to know who put him up to it. He tried to sell us the line that he was a new Texan patriot, trying to kill a tyrant, but we finally got the truth out of him. 
he was paid a thousand pesos to do the job, by a character they call Snake Eyes Sam Bonney, a cousin of the three who killed Mr. Cumshaw. "'Nephew of Kettlebelly Sam,' Peros interjected. "'You pick him up?' Nelson shook his head disgustedly. "'He's out in the high grass somewhere. We're still looking for him. Oh, yes, and I just heard that the trial of Switchblade, and Jack High and Turkey Buzzard, is scheduled for three days from now. You'll be notified in due form tomorrow, but I thought you might like to know in advance.' I certainly do, and thank you, Captain. We were just talking about you when you arrived, I mentioned, about the arrest, or rescue, or whatever you call it, of that trio. Yeah, one of the jobs I'm not particularly proud of. Pity Hickox boys didn't get hold of them before I got there. It'd have saved everybody a lot of trouble. Just what impression did you get at the time, Captain? I asked. You think Kettlebelly knew in advance what they were going to do? Sure he did. They had the whole jail fortified. Not like a jail usually is, to keep people from getting out, but like a fort, to keep people from getting in. There were no prisoners inside. I found out that they had all been released that morning. He stopped, seemed to be weighing his words, then continued, speaking very slowly. Let me tell you first some things I can't testify to, couple of things that I figure went wrong with their plans. One of Colonel Hickok's men was on the porch to greet Mr. Cumshaw, and he recognized the Bonnies. That was lucky, otherwise we might still be looking and wondering who did the shooting, which might not have been good for New Texas. He cocked an eyebrow, and I nodded. The Solar League, in similar cases, had regarded such planetary governments as due for change without notice, and had promptly made the change. Number two, Captain Nelson continued, that AA shot which hit their air car. I don't think they intended to land at the jail, it was just sort of a reserve hiding hole. But because they'd been hit, they had to land and they'd been slowed down so much that they couldn't dispose of the evidence before the colonel's boys were tapping on the door and asking couldn't they come in. I gather the colonel's task force was becoming insistent, I prompted him. The big ranger grinned. Now we're on things I can testify to. When I got there, what had been the cell block was on fire and they were trying to defend the mayor's office and the warden's office. These bonnies gave me the line that they'd been witnesses to the killing of Mr. Cumshaw by Colonel Hickok, and that the Hickok outfit was trying to rub them out to keep them from testifying. I just laughed and started to walk out. Finally, they confessed that they'd shot Mr. Cumshaw, but they claimed it was right of action against political malfeasance. When they did that, I had to take them in. They confessed to you before you arrested them? I wanted to be sure of that point. That's right. I'm going to testify to that Monday when the trial is held. And that ain't all. We got their fingerprints off the car, off the gun, off some shells still in the clip, and we have the gun identified to the shells that killed Mr. Cumshaw. We got their confession fully corroborated. I asked him if he'd give Mr. Peros a complete statement of what he'd seen and heard at Bonneville. He was more than willing, and I suggested that they go into Peros's office, where they'd be undisturbed. The ranger and my intelligence man got up and took a bottle of super bourbon with them. As they were leaving, Nelson turned to Hardy, who was still with us. "'You'll have to look to your laurels, Hardy,' Nelson said. Your ambassador seems to be making quite a reputation for himself as a gunfighter. Look, Hottie said, and though he was facing Nelson, I felt he was really talking to Stonehenge. Before I'd go up against this guy, I'd shoot myself. That way, I could be sure I'd get a nice, painless job. After they were gone, I turned to Stonehenge and Thromley. This seems to be a carefully prearranged killing. They agreed. 
Then they knew in advance that Mr. Cumshaw would be on Colonel Hickok's front steps at about ten-thirty. How did they find that out? Why, why, I'm sure I don't know, Thromley said. It was most obvious that the idea had never occurred to him before, and a side glance told me that the thought was new to Stonehenge also. Colonel Hickok called at 0900. Mr. Cumshaw left the embassy in an air car a few minutes later. It took an hour and a half to fly out to the Hickok Ranch. "'I don't like the implications, Mr. Silk,' Stonehenge said. "'I can't believe that was how it happened. In the first place, Colonel Hickok isn't that sort of a man. He doesn't use his hospitality to trap people to their death. In the second place, he wouldn't have needed to use people like these bonnies. His own men would do anything for him. In the third place, he is one of the leaders of the annexation movement here, and this was obviously an anti-annexation job. And in the fourth place, hold it, I checked him. Are you sure he's really on the annexation side? He opened his mouth to answer me quickly, then closed it, waited a moment, answered me slowly. I can guess what you are thinking, Mr. Silk. But remember, when Colonel Hickok came here as our first ambassador, he came here as a man with a mission. He had studied the problem, and he believed in what he came for. He has never changed. Let me emphasize this, sir. We know he has never changed. For our own protection, we've had to check on every real leader of the annexation movement, screening them for crackpots who might do us more harm than good. The Colonel is with us all the way. And now, in the fourth place, underlined by what I've just said, the Colonel and Mr. Cumshaw were really friends. "'Now you're talking,' Haughty burst in. "'I've known A.J. ever since I was a kid, ever since he married old Colonel McTodd's daughter. That just ain't the way A.J. works.' "'On the other hand, Mr. Ambassador,' Thromley said, keeping his gaze fixed on Hottie's hands and apparently ready to both duck and shut up if Hottie moved a finger. You will recall, I think, that Colonel Hickok did do everything in his power to see that these Bonnie brothers did not reach court alive. And let me add, he was getting bolder, tilting his chin up a little, it's a choice as simple as this. Either Colonel Hickok told them, or we have, and this is unbelievable, a traitor in the embassy itself. That statement rocked even Hottie. Even though he was probably no more than one of Natalenko's little men, he still couldn't help knowing how thoroughly we were screened, indoctrinated, and, let's face it, mind-conditioned. A traitor among us was unthinkable, because we just couldn't think that way. The silence, the sorrow, were palpable. Then I remembered, told them, Hickok himself had been a department man. Stonehenge gripped his head between his hands and squeezed, as if trying to bring out an idea. All right, Mr. Ambassador, where are we now? Nobody who knew could have told the Bonnie boys where Mr. Cumshaw would be at ten-thirty, yet the three men were there waiting for him. You take it from there. I'm just a simple military man, and I'm ready to go back to the simple military life as soon as possible." I turned to Gomez. There could be an obvious explanation. Bring us the official telescreen log. Let's see what calls were made. Maybe Mr. Cumshaw himself said something to someone that gave his destination away. That won't be necessary, Thromley told me. None of the junior clerks were on duty, and I took the only three calls that came in myself. First there was the call from Colonel Hickok, then the call about the wristwatch, and then, a couple of hours later, the call from the Hickok Ranch about Mr. Cumshaw's death. "'What was the call about the wristwatch?' I asked. "'Oh, that was from the Zasroff Embassy,' Thromley said. For some time Mr. Cumshaw had been trying to get one of the very precise watches which the Zasroff manufacture on their home planet. The Zasroff ambassador called that day to tell him that they had one for him and wanted to know when it was to be delivered. I told them the ambassador was out and they wanted to know where they could call him, and I—I I had never seen a man look more horror-stricken. 
Oh, my God! I'm the one who told them!" What could I say? Not much, but I tried. How could you know, Mr. Thrombley? You did the natural, the normal, the proper thing on a call from one ambassador to another. I turned to the others, who, like me, preferred not to look at Thrombley. They must have had a spy outside who told them the ambassador had left the embassy. Alone, right? And that was just what they'd been waiting for. But what's this about the watch, though? There's more to this than a simple favor from one ambassador to another. My turn, Mr. Ambassador, Stonehenge interrupted. Mr. Cumshaw had been trying to get one of the things at my insistence. Naval intelligence is very much interested in them, and we want a sample. The Zesroff watches are very peculiar. They're operated by radium decay, which, of course, is a universal constant. They're uniform to a tenth second, and they're all synchronized with the official time at the capital city of the principal Zesroff planet, the time used by the Zesroff navy. Stonehenge deliberately paused, let that last phrase hang heavily in the air for a moment, then he continued. They're supposed to be used in religious observances, timing hours of prayer, I believe. They can, of course, have other uses. For example, I can imagine all those watches giving the wearer a light electric shock or ringing a little bell all over New Texas at exactly the same moment. And then I can imagine all the Zesroff running down into nice deep holes in the ground. He looked at his own watch. And that reminds me, my gang of pirates are at the spaceport by now, ready to blast off. I wonder if someone could drive me there. I'll drive him, boss, Hotty volunteered. I ain't doing nothing else. I was wondering how I could break that up, plausibly and without betraying my suspicions, when Paros and Captain Nelson came out and joined us. I have a lot of stuff here, Paros said. Stuff we never seem to have noticed. For instance, I interrupted. Commander Stonehenge is going to the spaceport now, I said. Suppose you ride with him and brief him on what you've learned on the way. Then, when he's aboard, come back and tell us. Hottie looked at me for a long ten seconds. His expression started by being exasperated and ended by betraying grudging admiration. End of Chapter 6